then, um, I'm sorry, this is Axial T2 um, uh, weighted sequence demonstrating a um, large amount of joint diffusion within the knee with um, marked synovial thickening, or is that maybe fatty uh, densities within the, let's see here. So sagittal views, uh, this is a T1. Um, so again, large joint diffusion, and yes, multiple little uh, uh, fatty projections um, throughout the suprapatellar uh, joint space. So this is again uh, seeing that on the coronals, this is most suspicious of lipoma arborescence. Yeah, so this is a pretty characteristic case of lipoma arborescence. All right, so this is a 52-year-old male with uh, plaques on the left lateral thigh for 30 years, but they've increased in size. Um, oh, boy, so we're seeing on, okay, T1, uh, T2 fat sat imaging, this uh, kind of um, variegated mass-like uh, structure emanating from the thigh. Uh, let's see here. Looks to... Uh, have some kind of mixed signal, but there is fat within it. Oh boy. Um, I bet this is one of these uh, cutaneous. Uh, okay, so well, fat sat um, and enhanced. It's not enhancing all that much, but it is setting out. So I guess we're getting a couple little nodular areas of enhancement. So, uh, what, what, what's that called? Some kind of. Okay. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Tip of my tongue. That is lipomatosis superficialis. A lot of debate as to what these are, but they're, they're, they're not just lipomas because the edges are very varigous var and it's, it's really a growth. Uh, some people believe that these are really, uh, uh, nevus they come from cells that, uh, that are congenital that just migrate abnormally to the dermis and, and create a, abnormal fat in that area. Uh, especially when they're younger patients can have multiple lesions, especially in the lower back and gluteal region. When they present over the age of 20, usually it's uh, focal lesions and, and not multiple lesions. And histopathologically, it's just ectopic fat and the dermis it looks a little bit different. And there's a lot of debate over what these are, but they're, it's, it's benign. Okay. Okay. All right, so we have a sonogram image uh, with uh, color Doppler potent, so I see a fairly well-defined uh, hypoechoic mass uh, just below the subcutaneous fascia with no probable color uptake. There are some very, very hypodense areas, actually. I don't know whether they represent necrosis. All right, so this is the area of the ischial tuberosity, perhaps. So I think I'm looking at area near the insertion of the hamstring muscles. So just above the perirectal fascia, along the ischial fossa, I see a large fat density area on the CT image with internal septations. This on uh, T1 weighted images appears kind of hyper intense, and I see a very well defined, nice little capsule there. And on T2, I see, uh, uh, I see various small nodular structures inside and does not seem to have a lot of fat within it. I was like going, kind of going in the direction of dermoid, but I don't think it is dermoid now, considering the T2 characteristics, so. And on the fat sad images, again, it completely like saturates out. Yeah. Yeah, I was kind of going about dermoid, but I'm not quite sure. Yeah, so this is what a dermoid looks like okay. in a gross specimen, <laughs> and this was a dermoid cyst. Kind of like looked weird on the T2. It should be slightly bright on T2, right? Yeah, they, they vary a lot, but okay. it's kind of an oily st um, structure, and it's uh, 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 and it's and it really, if you if you go back here on some of these, it really doesn't look here. It really doesn't look like lipid tissue. Mm -hmm. On, on the T2 weighted axial images, though it certainly is bright on the T1. So mm -hmm. it has something that has relatively short T1, but it also has short T2 okay. signal in it. And uh, 
Uh, so it's it's really more of kind of an oily st structures inside of it, which gives it this very unusual characteristic, of, which is characteristic of a dermoid cyst. Dr. Cruz, I'm back, by the way. Oh, good. Okay, I hope that your patient survived. <laughs> yeah, Okay. Three minute arthrogram shoulder. <laughs> what? <laughs> Three minutes? <laughs> so we're looking at lipid type lesions. So why don't you take this case, Dan? All right. So we got a 54 year old female with right thigh growing mass for seven and eight years. The rubbery heart and non tender mass. So we got a frontal radiograph. We have a hyperdense lesion along the lateral aspect of the mid diaphragm of the femur and the sub Q fat. On the ultrasound, is kind of like. Mostly homogeneous, maybe a little bit of uh, internal, like increased echo, uh, without uh, a little bit, maybe maybe a little bit of posterior enhancement, a little okay. bit oh, through transmission. And then, yeah, and on axial, uh, looks like a T1 weighted and a maybe T2. Yeah, T1 to the right, T2 to the left. So we just see this uh, kind of multilobular. Um, Fat containing mass. It's kind of heterogeneous. And in, I don't know, this could be a little bit of, a, I guess, complex lipoma or a fibromyalgia lipoma, any of those. Yeah, this this is xanthoma. Which oh, xanthoma? Okay. Hard, uh, the uh, characteristics that were described of it, right? And it's benign. Uh, is this a specific, like, what, what would be more specific finding for this one? Well, I mean, I mean, I, you could certainly think of a dermoid cyst as well, like that last one, but it's uh, and, and it's in some ways kind of similar in characteristics. But it certainly looks sharply circumscribed. It doesn't look very aggressive. It does have lipid tissue in it, so kind of a it really looks like a benign type uh, lipid containing structure. But it doesn't have the characteristic appearance that we saw of lipomas before. So this would be one of the more atypical ones. And this would, in this particular case, histologically, they call this a xanthoma. And I don't really have any case of lipoblastomas, but you can get lipoblastomas. Uh, but uh, don't have that. So here, uh, Max, what do you think of this case? All right. So forty-year-old female with um, multiple sequences of the posterior knee, or I mean the thigh, there are several large lesions which are low signal intensity on T1, high signal on T2, and heterogeneous enhancement on post-contrast images. Now there is some little high signal on the T1, but it's predominantly low signal. But if you look at it, it's a little bit inhomogeneous, and there are some areas that are kind of high signal intensity uh, uh, within it, but it's very inhomogeneous on the other sequences. And you can't see it here very well, but there's kind of inhomogeneous enhancement on on the computer directly. So it's pretty much a solid mass, right? Because, I mean, it's centrally. Yep. I agree with you. Yeah. So, um, makes a liposarcoma. Okay. So this is a liposarcoma. The size, the irregular growth characteristics, the inhomogeneity uh, are all. And then, again, when you see most malignant lesions are not going to be full of uh, fat like we see in the typical lipomas. They tend to be lower in signal intensity, though you can see some areas of fat within it, uh, which kind of goes along with the histologic diagnosis of liposarcoma. Okay. Oh, sorry. Skip. Skip. All right, so we've got a 47-year-old physician with the buttock mass. Uh, we've got uh, coronal uh, T2 and uh, probably PDFS of uh, patient's um, pelvis. And over on the right, we're seeing this large, uh, slightly loculated uh, lesion. Uh, seems to be following fat uh, signal. However, there's this sort of central inferior part that looks a little bit more mixed and a little bit more kind of uh, heterogeneous. Um, so... Given the size and that little area there, I don't think we can comfortably just say that this is a lipoma. I think this is at least concerning for liposarcoma. So this was on 751, and uh, here are the axial images. 
Okay, so more of the same. Mm -hmm. You can actually see that there's an homogeneous fat suppression in the fat suppressed images. Okay, so this patient then went on to biopsy, and this was a low grade liposarcoma. They then resected it, uh, and this is what's the date? This is seven thirteen o one. This is seven five o one. So this is right after surgery. Uh, this is what it shows. So what do you see? Okay, well, uh, what I don't like is that we're seeing uh, sort of these recurrent little globules of uh, fat signal and this kind of uh, edema. So I'd be concerned that this might be coming back. So this is, and yeah. And then here, this is the area of the lesion. And you can see that there is some fat there mm -hmm. uh, in this particular case. And then this is dirt. Now, what, what I'm going to show you now are multiple images over the next few years when the patient came back for follow-up. And the key thing here is that every time the patient came back, they did a different protocol. And so they did not have the same sequences in the same plane. So this is 7.13.01. They actually went back. Uh, they, they were concerned about these. I think the patient went back and had another a, a, a second surgery. And this is the uh, MR scan after the second surgery. So this was uh, right at the very beginning, 2001. Okay. And, and now we can actually see we don't see those little globules of fat anymore. Those are gone. When they, when they went back in, they actually found persistent liposarcoma oh, that they then removed. So now the patient came back a year later. Okay, so um, a year later, it looks like we've got an axial stir plus an axial T1FS post contrast. Or T2 fat set, yeah, that's kind of funny. Yeah, T A T R. Okay. Oh, there, there's the old one. Okay. And this, yeah, kind of possible hypo intense dropout. I mean, it's, and a little bit of uh, fat kind of uh, interspersed. So, so they didn't have a straight T1 in the axial plane. Then the patient came back. Then the patient came back five months later, and this is a straight T1. And they, but they didn't have a fat suppressed T2 to compare with the prior one. So, so we're kind of comparing apples and oranges, and oranges here. So what do you see on the T1? Well, we are seeing some areas of fat si signal kind of uh, interdigitating within the, uh, in there and then up there, and even a little bit within the muscle itself so, there. So both of these were stated as being no evidence of recurrent tumor. Uh, so then the patient came back. Two years after that. And we're seeing a larger area of. Uh, and now we had no T1 axial on this sequence. <laughs> right. And we had no T1 coronal in the previous one. So I'm, just, I'm, I'm trying to make a point here. <laughs> um, I, I feel like if we had T1 axial here, that area we were talking about in the prior one would look uh, larger, <laughs> especially there. Because that's pretty that big and it didn't look that. Mm -hmm. Which, if you go back to the original one, we didn't put it. Let's see. And this is the uh, fat suppressed one in that area. And if we go to the axial, now here on the axial, they just had a fat suppressed axial. Great. And see, this is an area where the muscle and the fat are all suppressed so that they look very similar. So it doesn't really come out at you. Now they're on 12-17-07. And we have a fat suppressed coronal. <laughs> and if we go now, yeah. we've got a T1-weighted axial one that we can now compare back to, to several years before. Mm -hmm. And so, I think there's that finger-like projection of uh, fat uh, right so, there, which so is... this is thickening. Mm -hmm. so which is more than... And, and this is where it was before, which... See, so this patient at this time was oh found to have uh, persistent uh, sarcoma. Uh, and what, what happened with this case... So, here. So the bottom line is, and, and actually, we're going in retrospect. This is this is actually this is all liposarcoma, mm -hmm. all the all this fat here, and this was interpreted as being benign uh, uh, fat at that particular time, because again, we didn't really have a good correlation on the prior, uh, the same plane with the same technique on the prior surgery to compare with. And then when you fat sat everything, 
uh, it still has a lot of lipid in it, so you're suppressing the lipid and you're not really seeing the sarcoma as part of it. And then this was sarcoma here, uh, and that wasn't recognized because there was no T1 coronal pr prior to show that this was new fat that hadn't been there before. So anyway, so the, finally they came up that the patient had persistent sarcoma at this time, but at this time they were so they were concerned that it had been so infiltrative they weren't really sure where the margins were, so they ended up doing ha a hindquarter amputation in this patient, so they lost their entire leg at this particular time. So uh, this became a malpractice case. But the, the point here is for us to all learn with is it's really important, especially when you're dealing with cancer, but any th chronic disease, you have to maintain the same protocol. So you're comparing apples and apples. Just like I, I keep saying, and I'll say, it, I'll say it many more times for the end of the year, if you give contrast in one plane, you've got to have a T1 fat set pre and post that are identical sequences Otherwise, uh, you're comparing apples and oranges, and you're going to make mistakes. And people try to cut corners. And, uh, and, and there are some institutions where whoever the radiologist is there at the time wants their protocols done, and it's important to have standardized protocols so this sort of thing doesn't happen. Okay. Okay, let's go on to fibrous tissues. Okay, so I have a couple of uh, images of the foot and uh, sagittal plane. So at uh, the dorsum, I see a particularly well-defined oval structure, which is hypointense on uh, T1 and kind of uh, intermediate on uh, the stir images. So, uh, okay, so I have more images. So along the little finger, again, I have that uh, fibrous kind of uh, soft tissue thickening or lesion just along the uh, uh, the little digit. So multiple fibromas perhaps. Yeah. Well, this is major, is actually major symptoms were somewhere else, uh -huh. uh, but this is typical of a pressure lesion, okay. which is really fibrous thickening to recurrent pressure, mm -hmm. and it characteristically occurs uh, in areas where you have big pressure points. The base of the fifth is a common area. Okay. And, uh, the first and fifth monotarsal heads are a common area. Okay, uh, uh, Dan? Dr. Cruz, should we call them pressure ulcers or pressure lesions or just pressure points? Yeah, this isn't an, an ulcer. You, if you look at it, the skin is intact overlying it. Uh -huh. A lot of these are very uh, tender, and uh, uh, most people that I know just call them pressure lesions. Okay. Uh, they're not really true fibromas, uh -huh. but... Uh, and uh, uh, another thing, that another column, these are actually in the subcutaneous tissues, mm -hmm. but these are really the same thing as a callus. Okay. But the callus is primarily a dermal okay. in its location. This is okay. Okay. And the main thing is just to recognize them and not misinterpret them as being something okay. that's, that's not so benign. <laughs> okay. uh, Dan, what do you think of this case? Yep. <clears throat> We've got two sagittal images of the foot uh, looks like a T1 and steer image. Uh, we see this kind of globular mass, uh, the plantar aspect of the foot, which is T1 iso to lower signal and is bright on the uh, fluid sensitive sequence. And we see those coronal images again, uh, looks like the central cord of the plantar fascia is this mass is kind of rising. Um, probably like a fibroma with um, like, yeah, fibroma. Yeah, so this is called plantar fibromatosis. Uh, there are a lot of theories about what causes these. Some people feel that they're benign uh, uh, kind of neoplasms. Some people believe that they're repetitive trauma and hypertrophic scar formation because it's not allowed to heal properly. Uh, so that they tend to be symptomatic. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people will put this, these in the category of plantar fasciitis. Uh, as you know, I don't like that term because uh, I think 99% uh, of what happens in the plantar fascia is trauma and uh, partial tears. And uh, if you call it plantar fasciitis, it almost always gets filled up with steroids, whereas steroids will su substantially decrease healing and increase the risk for rupture and, and often make it worse. It can initially make it feel better but eventually it actually uh, inhibits the healing and, and 
can make the condition worse. So I think it's important to, to call it a tear because we've got a lot of evidence now that the majority of lesions within the plantar fascia are actually due to trauma. This one is kind of large. Uh, this, this could be a benign fibrous neoplasm, but it could also just be hypertrophic scar from, mm -hmm. from uh, repetitive trauma. Okay, uh, Max? All right, so we have uh, uh, axial and uh, sagittal views of the foot demonstrating the soft tissue mass that we just saw similar to the previous study in the region of the plantar fascia. It's uh, low signal intensity on T1 and high signal intensity on T2. Okay, so patient on the one surgical resection. So he had the plantar fibromatosis removed, okay? So, so this and it, be removed. And uh, mm -hmm. your Gudis isn't here today, and he would say, well, if you remove these, you have to have wide margins, because they're not malignant, but if you don't have wide margins, they will recur. And this is two years later. So now there is a high signal intensity structure um, in the midfoot on the T2 very sequence. And on the fat set, uh, let's see here, so there's Two by two, two with a sequence and a fat side with a sequence. I'm not seeing on the fat side with a sequence. Um, oh, actually, it is. Hmm. Okay. So this seemed to be a bit deep to the superficial fascias of the foot and is demarcated by the uh, muscles medially, so laterally. So this would be just recurrence. Okay. So this is a recurrent plan of fibroma, fibromatosis. There are a number of different fibromatosis syndromes, as you can see here. We won't go through all of these, but uh, in some of them in different locations. The, the primary thing is typically fibrous lesions in the periphery are benign. If you see fibrous lesions centrally in the core of the body, they're much more likely to be malignant. So you have to be more concerned about, like uh, intra-abdominal desmoid tumors tend to be more malignant, whereas extra-abdominal tend to be more benign. Okay, so this is a uh, middle-aged male with history of trauma now complaining of mass. Uh, looks like we've got uh, probably T1 and PDFS of uh, patient's uh, pelvis. Uh, now we have this round area of mixed hyperintense uh, signal abnormality. Uh, I presume the trauma was somewhat in that location. Uh, if, um, okay, and uh, yeah, there it is on a coronal a PDFS or STIR. Um, if that does correlate with the area of trauma, we could have a little bit of uh, myositis ossificans going on there, heterotrophic ossification. But if okay, so myositis ossificans and the low signal intensity area here would, would be calcified on that. If we had an ultrasound or the for the for the plate uh, and this is typical of you. And this is typically due to a tear of the muscles there. You can still see that there's a lot of edema around it. Uh, but in the healing phase, you get calcium deposits in there. That's my status of Okay. Let's see, we have a 28-year-old female with uh, leg mass. So we have uh, T1 images in axial and in the sagittal plane. So along the posterior musculature, I'm seeing a very ill-defined heterogeneous area with uh, mixed density components. It's basically hypointense with multiple interspersed hyperintense uh, foci. And I see them extending all along the posterior musculature in these sagittal images. Uh, with no history of trauma or with history of trauma, I think the differentials would be different. But again, I think this would be a case of myositis. Think about it. Now, this lesion is very large. There's not a history of trauma. Okay. There's a little bit of edema around it on the mm -hmm. uh, stir images. Okay. Uh, but oh. uh, this was an extra abdominal desmoid tumor. Okay. And this turned out to be benign. Uh -huh. But in a lesion this large, I would be very concerned. For malignancy. Uh, okay. Even though it's peripheral. Okay. You know, if this were more central, I'd be really worried about it. Okay. But peripheral, uh, I'd still be worried about it. But this turned out to be a benign desmoid tumor. Okay. Uh, Dan. 
Okay, we got a 49 year old female with hard soft tissue mass. Uh, we got a lateral or oblique uh, radiograph of the ankle, which shows um, like a uh, subcutaneous mass anterior to the uh, um, uh, ankle joint. And we have this uh, correlate on the MR. It looks like a T1, T2, and maybe a T1 pad of, uh, post contrast. Uh, that's that, where it shows. Um, uh, can you guys hear me? I'm just getting an error on this end. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, uh, looks like we have a low signal lesion, which is low on T1 and also, I mean, low on low to ISO T1, and then on T2 is pretty dark. And on the post contrast, it looks like maybe a rim enhancement, but no significant internal enhancement. Um, and then we see again on the axial images. Uh, the extent of this lesion is adjacent to the uh, anterior tendon, probably extensive digitorum longus, uh, but it doesn't look like invaded. So again, another desmoplastic. Yeah, this this turned out to be desmoplastic fibroblastoma, but again, it looks like a typical fibrous tumor. Mm -hmm. So if you just in your impression say like a likely a benign lesion, a fibrous tumor, you don't have to specify which histology. Correct? Yeah. No, we we can't determine the histology. I'm just giving you the histology so you have that here but all of these lesions all look the same on an MR and I don't think we can accurately di distinguish them so I think you, you need to put them in the fibrous category and uh, uh, and I think all of these kind of lesions either need to be biopsies or excisional biopsies but on the periphery most of these kind of all the vast majority of these lesions are going to be benign but we can't really differentiate. We can say that it's likely to be benign, but uh, uh, you, you can't confidently call it a benign lesion, but it, you can commonly call it a, a uh, fibrous uh, mass. Okay. And this shows uh, some other fibrous lesions and uh, more centrally, okay. Uh, Max. Yeah, so 40 year old female with right foot pain, three years ago, right foot, foot dorsum excision neuroma. So we have a mass within the medial aspect of the distal foot surrounding the first, second, and third, or, or plantar aspect of the first, second, and third metatarsal. It's low signal on T1, high signal on T2, and uh, I don't know what that uh, third sequence is. I presume it's um, uh, post-contrast? Probably. Yeah, yeah. so post-contrast. So it is enhancing diffusely. So again, it could be a, a, some form of myxomatous tumor or uh, fibroma. Okay, so, so this patient had prior surgery. They thought it was a neuroma at that time. Uh, their impression here was that this was just a large schwannoma, uh, but it turned out to be a plantar fibroma. Mm -hmm. Another fibrous, uh, a little bit more infiltrative characteristics, but yeah. okay. Uh, okay, so this looks like uh, T1 of uh, patient's chest, um, and I guess they're complaining of bilateral scapular pain. And what we're seeing in well, both regions are these uh, heterogeneous mixed signal uh, mass like structures. Um, with a little bit more hyperintense signal on the left than on the right. Um, this would be a good location for an elastofibroma. Uh, bilateral is a little, well, okay. <laughs> yeah. I've seen bilateral, so it's weird. Uh, you know, they're often very asymmetric in size, mm -hmm. but if you uh, look there, it's not uncommon for them to be bilateral, but they're usually yeah. asymmetric in size. Okay, so we have a 40 year old female with uh, mass at the left thigh. So I have a T1 uh, a PD fat set and uh, post contrast images. So basically, a very uh, it's kind of oblong shaped uh, T1 hyperintense, uh, T2 hyperintense, and uh, PD hyperintense lesion at the uh, antromedial aspect of the thigh. Uh, does not seem to be fibrous as such, looking at the T2 characteristics, but there are some complex elements within. Yeah. Okay, it's it's fibrous idea. again. <laughs> so, Andre, fibrous tumor. Okay. So, yeah. so, kind of a, Dr. Cruz. Oh, 
homogeneous. For this? Yes. All right. He says it's like a fibrous tumor, but on the on this one, it doesn't look so fibrotic. It looks, I don't know, it, it is not as low signal as you would expect. Well, it's very inhomogeneous here, and uh, I agree with you. Uh, and it doesn't really have the, the different kind of septations that you, we've often seen a lot of the others. Uh, but but that's, a, again, it just points out that uh, we're not accurate at, at giving histologic diagnosis uh, with MR. We can give the... We can put them in kind of in the ballpark and the location and size of the lesions very nicely. It has nice sharp margins, but uh, the signal characteristics are, are not specific. So, like, for example, if you give um, sarcoma as a differential on this one, and if they want to do an excisional biopsy of this, would that change the, the management or...? Well, if it were a sarcoma, then they would have to get very... Uh, the surgical management would be different because they'd have to be much more concerned about margins uh, and so forth. But uh, they would probably need to go in and, uh, well, you know, I, I'm not going to say I, I, I don't know that much about uh, the surgical management of these, but I would imagine that the, the, in a situation like this where it could either be benign or malignant, that they would really have to go in and and determine at the time of surgery with frozen sections what the pathology is and then determine how aggressive their surgery needed to be. Oh, I see. Thank you. Yeah. And these, you need to follow these up because they tend to recur, but not uh, metastasized. And there are a lot of characteristics that you can look for that help, but uh, none of them are really pathognomonic. Let's see. Who's next? Dan, are you next? I guess, yeah. So we have a 20-year-old female with a mass that's been enlarging for one year. We got two uh, chronal images. Um, I'm not sure if it's like a T1 post contrast, fat set, or it's a, um, maybe a fat set, just a PD fat set. But there's a PD fat set, and I think this is a T1 fat set post, I believe. Okay, so it looks like a hyper-intense lesion uh, along the hypothenar aspect of the hand, uh, but kind of like, I guess, encircles the fifth um, flexor tendon, maybe. Okay. Um, and, uh, I mean, it doesn't have a well-defined margin. I mean, it, it is, you could see, you could maybe draw it, but uh, actually, I will take it back. Maybe um, well-defined mass. Uh, Again, I guess it is like fibrous category. So we see on the sagittal images, uh, this expand cell mass, uh, given the size of the mass and no significant cortical erosion or any other soft tissue uh, infiltration, um, you would assume this is like a more benign lesion? Maybe, but look how irregular the margins are. The mar okay, on the inferior, I guess. The, it is. It on the Palmer side, yes. So, so I would be a little bit concerned about just, just looking at it. Here yeah. are the axial images. Mm -hmm. Looks like it's okay. Now that we have other, I guess, planes, uh, it looks like this is more like an infiltrative mass with ill-defined margins. Uh, and the image on the bottom says uh, PD, bad set, and the top is, I'm not sure, like, a, is it one of them is like a post-contrast image? Uh, let's see. This this is a PD. This is a PD fat set. This is probably a T1 fat set post. Okay. So it looks like it actually enhances a lot. Again, maybe a solitary fibrous tumor. Or does no tumor. The, the, this turned out to be fib fibromatosis. Mm -hmm. I would be very concerned in a lesion like this that it was malignant. It's turned out to be a benign but infiltrating lesion of uh, fibr fibromatosis. Fortunately, these are these are pretty rare. Oh, a rare, it's kind of aggressive fibromatosis, and then it's really treated with a fairly wide excision because you can see how infiltrated it is. That if you don't get a fairly wide excision, you're going to leave part of it in there, and it'll just uh, recur. Okay, uh, Dr. Next, Cruz. Yes. Yeah, the, 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 that case we had today had that very brisk enhancement. Would you have considered fibromonda? The one with the finger. Uh, 
that that was an odd location. I, yeah, you can certainly consider it, but uh, that was right next to the Proxmoor uh, interferon chill joint. I haven't really seen fibrous lesions in that location, but yeah, it, it would be low down in the differential. Mm, okay. So, 57-year-old male with pubic pain, there is an expansa lucent lesion within the uh, inferior pubic ramus, and it has some ground glass attenuation, uh, ground glass density to it. Um, so, we are looking at our axial CT demonstrating a expansile uh, major lesion within the pubic bone. It looks like the bone's all the way around it, but otherwise it's not. And I don't know why no. a bone lesion is in the soft tissue section, but anyway. Uh, well, could it be an intraosseous uh, fibromal? <laughs> well, <laughs> Making up stuff. Yeah. So here we go. Some enhancement. And mm -hmm. see the lesion coming out here. So it's got some soft tissue to it and yeah. pretty high on T2. Yeah. Um, and uh, they, they were, they were not sure what that is. And th this turned out to be a, uh, a low grade fibrosarcoma. Or I'm sorry, this, what, what, the frozen that they thought was a fibrosarcoma, when they removed everything and looked at it and sent it around, there was a lot of disagreement. So even the pathologist can disagree, but it turned out to be a fibrosarcoma <laughs> bone. So don't be too upset if you don't get the diagnosis on the MR when uh, <laughs> the pathologist can't agree. Dr. Cruz, on the radiographs, would you consider a diagnosis of fibrous dysplasia in this yes, case? Yes, I, I, I would. Absolutely. It's pretty expansive for that, but yes, that's that would have been the, probably the first thing we would have thought of. Okay, so coronal, satural, and axial images of a uh, patient's foot. Uh, looks like we've got uh, probably stern T1. Uh, and uh, yeah, on that uh, second inner space, we see this um, kind of oval uh, mass of uh, the interphalangeal space. Um, now, okay, T1 post, T1 pre, so it does enhance, um, and it is hypo prior. Oh, well, okay. Yeah, I was going to say a fibrous tumor with some little concerning characteristics, but I guess it was... But it has nice sharp it does, yeah. Uniform. Yeah, well circumscribed. So, you know, you kind of might think on the benign side, yeah. but when it comes to soft tissue masses like this, uh, you, 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 know, you just can't uh, clearly differentiate. So I think you have to be concerned about all of these. Morton's neuroma would be a differential for this case? or It's too big for Morton's neuroma. Too big I don't think you could ever get one that size. Okay, so 23-year-old female, recurrent mass in the right thigh. So a uh, skin marker is placed just adjacent to it. So kind of just in the subcutaneous tissue, I see a small nodular structure, which is kind of hypo-intense and then kind of becomes hyper-intense on uh, the PD fat set images. And it's very well-defined and loosened. Uh -huh. Okay, Jeff said he's not going to make it. Do their high volume. Uh, I don't know what that represents, but perhaps a fatty lesion, perhaps, I guess. And then he, he points out the fat split sign, okay. which at one time was thought to be pretty specific, but now it's found to be seen in a lot of things. But I thought it was kind of specific for a, uh, a schwannoma type oh, lesion. Oh, okay. So, but here we can, we can see on the axial images, this is actually within the muscle. Mm hmm and this was dermatofibrosarcoma protuberance. Okay. <laughs> now, most of the ones I've seen have been more in the skin and they actually kind of protrude out, kind of a firm mass. Uh, but, but these are actual uh, sarcomas. Mm -hmm. uh, though they, they don't have as high a metastatic potential as a lot of other sarcomas, but it really needs to be treated as a, as a sarcoma lesion. So we can now go to the fibrohistiocytic. Uh, Let's see, uh, Dan. Uh, we've got a 21-year-old male with back pain for five years. Um, kind of hard to see the lumbar spine, but 
I'm sorry, the thoracic spine. I'm not sure if there's any litigation. Oh, okay. So we got two sagittal images. Yeah, if you go back here, there is a little bit of a soft tissue mass back Soft tissue. Okay. Right in through, but it's just thickening here. It's hard to see on the plane film. So there is this uh, um, well-defined kind of like um, heterogeneous mass, uh, which is to hyper intense or PD fat set intense lesion posterior to the spinous process of the thoracic spine um, with a, kind of sub, some septations and um, heterogeneous um, signal. Um, and are those, uh, again, PD fats? Any of them post contrast? I think these are all post contrast. Uh, so I'm not sure if this is like all avidly enhancing or not. But it's pretty bright. It probably is, but again, right. you need to have the right sequences to determine that. But once you assume it's enhancing, right? So, and then we have the we have the ultrasound, which shows this kind of like hypoechoic mass with some shadowing um, on the posterior acoustic shadowing. So, um, the image on the right uh, just just shows this kind of hypoechoic mass uh, without any uh, features. So this turned out to be a benign fibrous histiocytoma. The majority of fibrous histiocytomas that we see are malignant, even despite the name, uh, though I think the current terminology doesn't use this anymore. Uh, the, I think they've divided this up into multiple other tumors. But a lot of people still use the term fibros, fibrous histiocytoma. Okay, uh, Max? All right, so we got sagittal. Uh, T1 and post contrast, pre and post contrast images, uh, demonstrating uh, uh, enhancing uh, uh, and low signal intensity on T1 and in post contrast enhancing uh, lesion in the dorsal distal aspect of the foot. Um, it is extrinsic to the so to the adjacent muscle, so uh, again, could be some form of. Uh, I'm not sure what this would be. Maybe We've got a lot of smudging uh, contrast enhancement. And smudgy contrast enhancement, and then is this connected also to a longitudinal structure here? Mm -hmm. Often, smudgy enhancement is typical of schwannomas, so that's one thing you have to think about. Uh, here, here are other images of it. See, so it's low signal on the T1 and high signal on the on the inversion. I mean, a PD fat set sequence, so probably has some uh, mixed omatous. I don't think we're in the schwannoma section, though. <laughs> no, so it must be fibroma. <laughs> yeah, so oh, giant so fibroma. Giant soup. So both the benign fibrous histiocytoma and giant cell, these are usually within the bones. So this is the soft tissue type of the same oh. disease. Uh, fibrous histiocytoma is usually a soft tissue lesion. Usually it's a malignant variety, much more common. It's one of the more common malignant soft tissue tumors. And uh, giant cell tumor of tendon sheath is general is a long tendons. Okay. Now well, here's a 55-year-old male, status post giant cell excision six years ago. Um, evaluate for amputation. Um, so we've got, I guess, these uh, coronal series through the uh, toes, and uh, that's probably the fourth toe there that's got um, this somewhat large heterogeneous uh, structure emanating from it. Um, I mean, I'd be certainly concerned for a recurrent uh, lesion. And hmm, yeah, so there it is kind of, uh, seems to be almost destroying the, uh, the joint spaces there too, at the very least the distal interphalangeal. Huh, okay. Now we've got uh, kind of this uh, heterogeneous. Yeah, that's strange. Um, okay. uh, well, so he's got a couple uh, kind of intermediate heterogeneous lesions back around the subtalar joint uh, with some erosion. Um, and it looks like there's a little fat component there too. So, uh, okay, T2 pre, T1 pre. 
Okay, so well, there's a lot of T1 signal enhancement wise. Mm, yeah, not really, I'd be hard pressed to call this much enhancement. Ah, okay, that that would do it. <laughs> so they got PBS. Okay, so we have like series of radiographs of the uh, finger. So we are basically concentrating on the proximal interphalangeal joint where the proximal phalanx has kind of uh, ill-defined erosion with a lot of soft tissue component alongside it. The opposite cort cortex is kind of intact. So on the MR images, uh, uh, I see a very well-defined hypo-intense area, which is kind of separate from the tendon along the site of the soft tissue marker so and these are a couple of axial images which are again showing the same thing the tendon is kind of separate from it so probably arising from the tendon sheath so giant cell tumor of the tendon sheath Look, this is a hand. <laughs> uh, we got uh, three axial images of the hand and two sagittals. Uh, we got this kind of infiltrative mass along the palmar aspect of the third array, uh, which has looks like a T1, which is the middle one, uh, hypo to iso intense, and also enhancement peripherally, mostly on the post contrast images. It's kind of heterogeneous enhancement along the uh, flexor tendon region. Oh, I was gonna go with like you know a more aggressive like you know giant cell tumor, um, but this is like a sarcoma. Yeah, this turned out to be an epithelioid sarcoma. Uh, I guess it's a little bit more aggressive than typical typical PVNS. Uh, I don't think I've ever made, seen an epithelioid sarcoma. <laughs> in reading cases, but I've seen a lot of PBNS. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, I just have to realize that uh, uh, there are other things that can look a lot like PBNS that may be more ominous. Okay. Max? All right, so we got the 44-year-old male with ankle, ankle mass excision at local clinic two weeks ago. So we have an X-ray of the uh, ankle demonstrating soft tissue swelling of the lateral ankle. Um, there's some heterogeneous mineralization of the adjacent bone of the distal fibula. On the ultrasound images, we have a inhomogeneous synecho texture hypoechoic, uh, ill-defined lesion of the lateral ankle. Um, MR sequences of uh, axial and uh, coronals are demonstrating a high signal intensity, ill-defined lesion throughout the lateral ankle. Actually, most of it's more in you know, a homogeneous high signal intensity. And um, it is uh, showing uptake on the, uh, I believe that's a PET, right? No, or is that a bone scan? Yeah. I'm not sure what that is. I think it's a PET scan. Could be a gallium scan. I'm not sure actually. Oh, it's a yeah, yeah. So, um, not sure. Is it fibroma again? Well, this is what they did to it. <laughs> so, maybe liposarcoma or no, it wouldn't be a liposarcoma. So, this is a oh, malignant. Yeah, it's just cytoma. <laughs> Which, as we said, was a more aggressive and it's a much more common than, in my experience, than the benign type. And you can see the margins are much more ill-defined, and it looks like a more infiltrative type lesion. In this case, they couldn't dissect it from the bone, so they had to resect the bone with it. Yeah, so, and here's a kind of new name. Some people call it pleo pleomorphic fibrous histiocytoma or undiffer undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma. But th these names change all the time, so it's... Obviously, uh, in the pathology world, you have to keep up with it, but you know, not everybody agrees on the, on the terms, too, when they change. So let's go to smooth, smooth muscle lesions. Okay. 
so it's like a coronal and maybe a sagittal, I guess, uh, image of a uh, patient's uh, thigh and knee. Post, okay, and then T1 pre without fat sat. Um, you know, I don't want to necessarily call this, um, okay, well, yeah. So on the uh, post, there is this kind of heterogeneous uh, enhancement, well, presumed enhancement characteristic. I don't want to really commit myself without a FS pre, but it sure seems to be enhancing. Um, we're on smooth muscle lesions. I uh, could just have kind of luminous thing. Um, yeah, okay, so pretty uh, similar characteristics here on the uh, axials. Uh, it's well circumscribed, but it's got this heterogeneous uh, enhancement and internal, yeah, just a lyoma, yeah, like I thought. This reminds me of lyoma, presumably of the uh, vessel walls on one of the vessels there. Sure. It's a large benign lesion. Yeah. Would we consider a nerve tumor in that case, considering that we see uh, a thin linear structure like just going into the yeah. What, what would we consider? Uh, uh, nerve tumor. A nerve tumor. Yeah, you certainly could put a nerve tumor in the differential. It looks uh, like a schwannoma, actually. Yeah. Uh, it looks a little different from a schwannoma. Could, could be, but the, 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 the character, you can't see it up on that screen, but on this screen you can see the inhomogeneity okay. nature of it is a little bit different than a typical schwannoma, which has more of a smudgy type appearance to it. Uh, I would be more concerned. I, I mean, statistically, it's on uh, MFH. It's it more common. More likely. Okay. So I would be concerned. We were concerned that this was a malignant lesion at the time, but it turned out to be malign. Okay, for next case, it's a 45 year old male with uh, mass for six months. This kind of seems to be the region of acromioclavicular joint. Yeah, it is acromioclavicular joint. So, on uh, the post-saturated sequences, it kind of enhances heterogeneously with a lot of necrotic component uh, within it, and uh, same thing we see on the sagittal images. So, I would be considered, I would be concerned for uh, malignant fibrous histiocytoma or myxoma, perhaps. Some sort of sarcoma, maybe. Yeah. And it looks like there may be some necrosis in it yeah. that's not enhancing. And this was a lamau sarcoma. Now we can look at skeletal muscle tumors. Uh, so we got a 27 year old female with a thigh mass. Um, it looks like uh, there's a kind of iso intense uh, mass on that axial T1. And on the sagittal, it looks like maybe there's a T2 or PD, I'm not sure. Uh, there's like a well defined. Uh, mass uh, within the, I think, vastus intermedialis, I believe, uh, which shows, um, uh, it looks like it's actually enhancing, although we don't have a T1 pre bad set. Uh, mass. Uh, yeah, and, and this one is kind of bright on the T1. It's brighter than muscle, actually. Right. So my guess is if you did mm -hmm. fat suppression, this might come out and look like it's very bright. So right. it's hard to say whether it's enhancing or not. There's, there might be or not enhancing. And then, uh, you know. So, so this was a malignant lesion. <laughs> and uh, they felt it was hypervascular. This was an alveolar soft part sarcoma, which are fairly common. But other lesions to think about, there's a pretty big differential diagnosis of highly vascular or soft tissue lesions. And most of them are not good. And here, can you hear you, in this particular case, you can actually see the uh, the vessels going into the lesion, knowing that it's showing how hypervascular it is. Okay. Max? All right, so four months old, uh, left leg swelling and fever, left posterior thigh, painful swelling and fever for one week. Um, posterior thigh, so there is, on the right side, there is a uh, kind of increased density of the soft tissues I hope I'm looking at the right place. Yes, that's the area right there. It's kind of ill-defined looking. Um, and on the left, looks normal. And on the um, T2, PD fat sets, where the sequences of extensive high signal intensity, ill-defined structure surrounding the vessels. So I'm wondering if uh, this is some form of, and it's in going into multiple compartments um, and multiple muscles. So it could be a, some form of angiosarcoma or 
Yes, um, I think we're dealing with uh, with uh, skeletal muscle tumors. But we can see is so, the margins are very indistinct. Uh, this one did enhance quite vigorously. There's the ultrasound showing some vascularity around it anyway. And, it, and this is, now, when was this? This was the first study, a uh, four-year-old male. It doesn't give a date, okay? I think this is a follow-up study. So they got bigger. And yeah, it's extensive. Not that much longer, but now we can see much more edema uh, involving uh, it going actually even into a different compartment in this case. And this is a rhabdomyosarcoma. circle. Mm -hmm. yes. they, often, they often look more like infections because of all the edema. Okay. Okay, so here we have a couple radiographs of this uh, five-year-old male presenting with buttock swelling for one month, and uh, especially looking at that um, lateral view, it does look like we've... Okay, yeah, <laughs> okay. Okay, there it is. So I do see some kind of uh, indistinct uh, soft tissue swelling uh, kind of adjacent to that hip uh, joint on the left, kind of down, you know, maybe up there, or maybe there's a couple of... Yeah, okay. I guess it was. Uh, so now it looks like we've got, uh, well, okay, T1 coronal pre T1 FS post. Um, despite the lack of fat set on the pre, I would wager that this is enhancing. And uh, there we are in axial, um, a lot of enhancement again, we, and a lot of uh, kind of heterogeneous uh, character as well, which is better appreciated on the uh, screen here. Uh, you know, I'd be and some cystic changes. I mean, we'd still be concerned for uh, malignancy here. Um, you know, rising from the muscle, looks like we're um, FDG Abbott on pet. Is that what we're doing? So. Yeah, so uh, more concerning. Um, I'm not seeing, yeah, so another rhabdo. Okay, so this is so we have like series of uh, uh, axial images of the chest. So I see certain soft tissue nodules uh, right in the subtural location and one uh, in the first image, uh, perhaps in the upper zones there. Yeah. I think it's because of the metastasis of rhabdomyosarcoma, yeah, I, I guess. Yeah. One, so this, yeah, just showing, yeah, this has a high propensity. So why don't we stop here? And we'll talk about vascular tumors uh, tomorrow. Okay, any questions? No. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Yep.